the bike, still considered by many as the world's greatest invention. When you start racing the world's greatest invention, you guarantee a spectacle. The Olympics in Beijing saw Spain's Samuel Sanchez win from a small group sprint. Just pipping Italy's David Rebellin and the Olympic time trial champion Fabian Cancellara to the line. Sanchez's hometown of Oviedo has created a statue in his honour. He said, winning the Olympics is in itself extraordinary. There's nothing more gratifying than sport. It feels incredible. The joy and relief of winning the event is obvious. After training for 30,000 kilometres a year, working on your endurance, your speed and your gale, it must be an amazing feeling. Samuel Sanchez completed the 245.4 kilometre race in 6 hours, 23 minutes and 49 seconds, giving him an average speed of around about 39 kilometres per hour. And in all money, that works out at around about 24 miles per hour. Understanding the basic physics of this event will give you a greater appreciation of just what these athletes do. The first thing to understand is how the forces act to make the bike move and stop. When a cyclist pushes on their pedals, the force is transmitted along through the chain to the back wheel. This provides a force going forwards, pushing the bike. As the cyclist pedals harder, more force is generated, pushing the bike forward. This causes the bike to accelerate. However, as the bike accelerates, the wind and the friction from the wheels acts in the opposite direction to the bike. In this situation, the force going forward is bigger than the force going backwards, so therefore the bike continues to accelerate. If the cyclist doesn't pedal any harder, the forces going forward and backwards will eventually equal out. This means the cyclist will be travelling at a constant speed. If the cyclist brakes, a bigger force will be acting against the force going forward. As the cyclist stops to pedal, the force going forward will get smaller and smaller and eventually the cyclist would stop. In this situation, the forces are still balanced. The forces going forward zero and the forces going back are zero and the cyclist has a constant speed again which just happens to be zero miles per hour. As is becoming clear the air resistance is a major obstacle for the cyclist. The faster they travel, the greater the air resistance. But it's caused by the friction of the air molecules hitting the cyclist on their bike. So to overcome this the cyclist wears smooth close fitting clothes, has a streamlined bike and has got handlebars to tuck out of the wind. The safety helmets are also designed to save energy and hair Now, Imagine if all cycle helmets were square. As you pass through the air, the wind would blow against your helmet with nowhere to go. It would end up pushing you backwards. Stop. The modern cycling helmet, it is a streamlined shape. So rather than the air strike the front of the helmet, it passes cleanly over the top, reducing the air resistance. Therefore the cyclist has to push less hard to cut through the wind. To win bike races, cyclists will also use tactics to reduce the air resistance they face. By riding the type behind a teammate or even behind a rival and save themselves much needed energy. Although it may sound that friction is always negative for cycling, here's an example of where it's really quite beneficial. This is done through a cleat on the bottom of the shoe, which fits into the pedal and stops the support from slipping. The Beijing course involves seven loops each with a very steep energy sapping climb in the middle. This highlights the biggest force a cyclist will have to battle against, and that is gravity. As a cyclist climbs up the hill, the force of gravity is trying to pull them back down to the bottom. Great while descending, 
and especially great for Samuel Sanchez, considered to be one of the finest descenders in the peloton, but climbing is another matter altogether. In this animation we can see gravity adding to the force acting against the direction that the cyclist is moving, causing them to decelerate or slow down. If the cyclist wants to maintain or increase their speed, they must provide more force by either pushing harder on the pedals or spinning the pedals faster. So, what muscles are used to provide these forces? All muscles work antagonistically. That is to say, they work in pairs with each muscle working against the other. Cycling uses all the muscles in the upper and lower leg in a particular pattern so that a smooth force can be applied throughout the full turning of a pedal. First, the gluteus maximus and quadriceps push the pedals down, which is the biggest force generated. The fibrous anterior, or the shin splints, then help the pedal turn around, followed by the gastronemius and the soleus of the calf, which begin to lift the pedal, as do the hamstrings before the cycle begins again. The antagonistic pairs on this diagram are linked by colour.